So good morning, everyone. So hello and thank you. I guess afternoon for some of you. Thank you all for being here today. We uh, would like to start by thanking the Navy Child and Youth Programs for making today's webinar possible. And also thank you for taking that initial poll, those of you that were able to do that. We see that we have professionals joining us today and we thank you for being here. We always welcome professionals who work with our military connected children to our parent trainings. We do know that you will get something from it, from the information and from the tips that we present, but please note that our parent, our MSEC parent support webinars have been designed with parents as the target audience. So before we introduce ourselves, I wanna share a little bit more about MSEC and its mission. The Military Child Education Coalition, or MSEC, is a nonprofit organization established more than 25 years ago. Its mission is to support all military connected children by educating, advocating, and collaborating um, to resolve education challenges that are associated with our military lifestyle. In 2005, MSEC formalized support and programming for our military connected parents, you all so that you may be empowered, informed, and proactive in supporting your children's educational journey. We strive to deliver these informative and interactive webinars that address academic, social, and emotional issues associated with a military family lifestyle. Our vision, M6 vision, is for every military connected child to be college, life, and work ready. So let me tell you a little bit about who I am. My name is Michelle Brashear. I'm joining you today from snowy, icy, and 16 degrees northern Alabama, which is very odd for us, <laughs> Madison, Alabama. My husband and I moved 14 times during his almost 30 years of active duty Army service. We have raised two incredible military-connected children who obviously had to change schools multiple times, including uh, to and from a Dodea school in Wiesbaden, Germany. For anybody who's been there, our family has experienced you know, many of the challenges that are associated with this military lifestyle. Um, because we've been there, our family, I really enjoy sharing these workshops with you all. And I've been doing that with MSEC since 2017. Catherine? Thanks, Michelle. My name is Catherine Kotowski. I am also a parent educator for MSEC. I'm also an active duty military spouse. My Husband has been in the Army for over 20 years, and we've been married for over 16. I am joining you also snowed in from Northern Virginia, uh, where we got a whole lot of snow this week, too. Um, I have three military-connected children. They are in ninth grade, seventh grade, and fifth grade, so we cover the range from elementary school all the way to high school. I've been with MSEC since early 2021 as a parent educator, as a webinar presenter, and also as a professional development trainer. So just a couple of administrative announcements before we continue. At the end of this webinar, we would like to invite you to take our survey about today's presentation. We would really appreciate the two or three minutes it would take to give us a little bit of your feedback. This is the key method that we use to tell our funders what we're doing and also to make adjustments so that we can continue offering the very best training to you, the military connected parents that we serve. You will see a chat box there on your screen where you can ask questions during this webinar and also where we hope to get some feedback from you. We hope to have a little bit of interaction during our webinar today. So please feel free to use this feature in Zoom. As always, we encourage parents to share resources with each other, but just note that MSEC does not allow advertising for paid services during our parent webinars. You should see a PDF file there in your chat box that states downloadable resources. This contains some resources and information relating to today's webinar. Know that if you are joining us on your phone, you will not be able to download, download that resource, but if you will just private message us with your email address, we will make sure to email it to you later today. Please know that this webinar is being recorded and you can always view that recording later. We will let you know how to do that at the end of the webinar. If you'd like to review the material or if you experience any technical difficulties during our presentation today. So let's get on to our learning objectives. By the end of this webinar, it's our hope that parents will be able to understand how their children learn, to discuss some strategies to help their children learn, how to apply some practical techniques to help children improve their memory, which is part of learning, and also to recognize common learning obstacles and some ways to overcome them. 
So when we talk about learning, learning is the process of acquiring new understanding, new knowledge, new behaviors, skills, values, attitudes, and preferences. So I would love to hear from you all in the chat box. When is the last time you learned something new? We'd love for you to share in the chat box. This military lifestyle gives all of us, including the adults, so very many opportunities to learn new things. I can tell you in the past couple of years, I've learned how to navigate the DC metro system. When we were in Washington state two years ago, I learned how to snowshoe. And when we were in Kansas a few years before that, I learned how to tack a horse for English style riding because I had a nine-year-old who was starting riding and she was too short to do it all herself. So she and I both learned new skills during that activity. I see Michelle mentioned that she recocked her shower last week. <laughs> DIY. We recently purchased a home. So yes, I've also learned a lot of DIY techniques. So we would love, please continue to share in the chat box to, as much as you feel comfortable. Learning is something that we all do, even, even adults and especially kids. We do it all the time. And our children start learning the very day that they are born. They learn a lot of different ways. One of the way children learn is by association. This is not necessarily intentional, mindful learning, but rather learning through experience, having one experience and then relating it to another. So for example, when kids are playing together, they a child may have a ball to themselves that they then share with a friend. That friend responds very positively. They play together and they have fun. And at that point, that child has learned that sharing often results in more fun. So that's kind of how we associative learning. Children also learn conceptually. Conceptual learning uses executive processes to which mental resources have to be allocated. That is, with conceptual learning, children have to actually engage their brains to take small pieces of information that they're given and that they're receiving and then organize it into bigger concepts. It's more than rote memorization of facts. It's learning key ideas. So for for example, multiplication. A child can just memorize the fact that three times five is 15, but they can also understand the concept that multiplication of three times 15 is th or three times five is 15, that, th that that is three groups of five equals 15. And understanding these concepts can help them apply those concepts to different situations. So that's another way of learning. Children also experience cognitive development throughout their childhood. This is a development of knowledge, skills, problem solving, and dispositions. This helps children to think about and understand the world around them. And brain development is part of cognitive development. Michelle? Well, I'm going to go ahead and show a quick movie and see if you all can relate to this. Your test should be clear of everything but your pencils. If only I could pull off a B minus or, or a C or a C minus. Okay, let's just take it slow and easy here. From the top. Question number one. Hmm, nothing familiar. Well, just find a question you know how to do and do that one first. <clears throat> Pay no attention to that. Move right along to the next one. about four minutes to attain total panic. I was a drowning man looking for anything to cling to. Anything.
And that's when I realized I'd sunk as low as a person in eighth grade algebra could sink. So did any any of you feel the stress <laughs> that he was feeling in that movie? I know I did. <laughs> I remember, you know, even way back when I was in school, you know, maybe he didn't study quite enough for one of those topics and it's just overwhelming. But imagine your own kid in that situation, right? So we we don't want that to happen for our kids. Um, so let's see what what we can do. We as parents can't control what happens in the classroom. We can teach our children how to learn better. So military connected kids like ours, we know change schools often. So without proper guidance and those correct learning tools, those learning gaps can easily appear and be difficult to maneuver over. So subjects like math are sequential. So they build, the knowledge builds on itself. So without the proper support at home, those learning gaps can get wider and wider throughout the years. So let's look at what happens in the brain when we learn. Neuroscience has helped us understand what happens. Understanding how our kids learn, happen, it helps us to understand how we can help our kids. The brain reaches its largest size, just size, in the teen years, but actually continues to mature well into the 20s. So physiologically, an adult brain is different from a child's brain, but the learning process is still the same. Our brains are complex. Neurons are the brain cells in charge of that learning process. The neurons communicate with each other through electrical signals. And when learning, the brain connections build and strengthen, creating like these links. And the more the brain learns, the stronger and thicker those links become. The less communication that happens between the neurons, the weaker the links become and they can even disappear. So Catherine and I both have swimmers. So let's just compare it to that. So think about an athlete. The more they train, the faster and the stronger they get. But if they stop training, some of that speed and strength will be lost, but they can always begin to train again and get faster and stronger. So the same thing happens with the brain. You need to use it. So we have another, just kind of an interesting about how the brain works. The key to forming strong brain architecture is what's known as serve and return interaction with adults. In this developmental game, new neural connections form in the brain as young children instinctively serve through babbling, facial expressions, and gestures. And adults return the serve, responding in a very directed, meaningful way. It starts very early in life, when a baby coos and the adult interacts and directs the baby's attention to a face or hand. This interaction forms the foundation of brain architecture upon which all future development will be built. It helps create neural connections between all the different areas of the brain, building the emotional and cognitive skills children need in life. For example, here's how it works for literacy and language skills. When the baby sees an object, the adult says its name. This makes connections in the baby's brain between particular sounds and their corresponding objects. Later, adults show young children that those objects and sounds can also be represented by marks on a page. With continued support from adults, children then learn how to decipher writing and eventually to write themselves. Each stage builds on what came before, ensuring that children have adult caregivers who consistently engage and serve in return interaction beginning in infancy builds a foundation in the brain for all the learning, behavior and health that follow. So you can see how we as parents play a big role in how our kids you know, are able to learn all throughout their lives. So let's take a look at some of the ways that the brain learns. There's actually two ways of learning. There is uh, focused which and, and diffused. The focus is when you have that full attention to a problem or an idea. So you're writing an essay, you're trying to solve that math problem like Kevin was doing, 
or you're studying French vocabulary. Then you have the diffuse model. Uh, th this is where the mind's kind of wandering and relaxes their attention. They're thinking about the big picture instead of that focused attention, allowing for creativity. Um, the diffuse thinking isn't centered on just one part of the brain. The work is spread out in multiple areas. So it allows the brain to connect newly learned information with that stored information. Uh, that leading to deeper thinking and actually better retention. So think about thinking about maybe you're the topic of the paper that you're working on while you're in a shower or going over a math problem in your head while you're you know going for a walk. So the brain goes from focus to diffuse mode and back and forth all the time, but it cannot do both at the same time. Both but both modes are equally important during the learning process. So we have a question for you. Let us know, maybe raise your hand or an emoji button or something. If you have ever been in a situation when you're trying to learn a new skill, like a new recipe maybe, or working on a computer, when suddenly your child or your spouse starts telling you something that happened that day and you acknowledge them, mm -hmm, I got it. But later during dinner, uh, they want you to recall something that they said to you and you don't remember. Does anybody, can anybody relate to that? I know that I can, and I always get that way. Well, you weren't listening, <laughs> but I was. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> it happens to all of us. We, we wanna listen and we try, but sometimes our minds just aren't there. So it happens because our brains were so focused on what we were doing, and it was using that focus mode of learning to complete that task. But our brain goes back and forth from focus to diffuse, but again, cannot do both at the same time. So when your kids are doing homework, maybe writing an essay, they need to use their brain focus mode. And if they don't know it and they don't know techniques on how to activate it, they can easily get distracted. So to maximize their potential and their productivity, they do need to use both types of thinking. So let's look at some techniques to use both types of thinking. So first we talk about the ping pong technique, and this is works to focus on a task or a problem. And when it becomes a little bit too difficult, you're working on a math problem and you're just, you're focusing, focusing, and it's you're just not getting it, switch to something different. Maybe get like, like Kevin, go to try to find one you can do, <laughs> or take a walk or a nap or listen to music, get a snack and then return. This relaxation can actually change the way you look at the problem. Uh, your brain, when you're taking that brain, that break, your brain is actually subconsciously still working on that task. So that's that's one. And Catherine, I think you're going to talk to us about a little bit more. Sure. Thanks, Michelle. So did you know that Isaac Newton was allegedly chatting with a friend or watching an apple orchard when he had his big epiphany about gravity? And also Thomas Edison was reported to having many of his aha moments while taking naps in his own chair. The point of this is that that diffused learning is a very important part of creative thinking and relaxation is actually a very important part of the learning process. So that that takes us to the Pomodoro technique. The Pomodoro technique is another strategy for maximizing both that focused learning, uh, focused thinking and diffused learning. This is a technique that was developed by Francesco Cirillo, and it was designed to actually eliminate procrastination, which I know I personally have lots of issues with procrastination, as I think so many of us do. This is a super easy technique to use at home and to teach to your kids. To use this technique, the first thing you're going to make sure you have is a timer or a stopwatch. And then, so step one is eliminating or reducing as much as possible any distractions, anything that might serve serve as a deterrent to productivity. Could be a cell phone or a tablet, potentially the TV, some toys, 
for our kids, especially our older kids, that may include their siblings as much as they can be taken out of the equation when your student is doing homework. Note that some students, particularly if you do live in a smaller space and there are lots of kids in the house, some students can really benefit from noise canceling headphones. Others may actually concentrate better with music on. We would encourage you to try music that doesn't have words. There are great instrumental stations on all the musical, all the music streaming platforms. Even they don't even have to be classical, although that's a good choice. Sometimes there you can find stations with instrumental versions of all the popular songs on the radio. So that's something to consider to help stay focused. So it's important to reduce all these distractions because they might make it difficult for your child to, to, to concentrate and focus on their work, especially when they're doing something difficult or unfun that they don't really want to do that. So you want to take any away anything that's going to be distracting or can divert them from that focus time. Then you're going to take that timer and set it for 25 minutes of focused attention. And during those 25 minutes, your student is going to stay on one task. Now, for younger kids, you can still use this technique, although you may want to cut back the time to 15 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever is age appropriate for them. Then, so you work for those 25 minutes focused on that one task. And when the timer goes off, you stop and set it again for 15 minutes of relaxation. That relaxation time should also include some sort of reward for staying on task. Reward could be watching a funny video or cuddling with your dog or your cat or maybe talking to a friend or just doing something else. Looking forward to that reward actually helps the brain to focus better during those 25 minutes of focus time. And then after the after the focus time, then set the, the timer again for another 25 minutes. Now, it's important that during that 25 minutes of focus time that the, you or your student, you're not switching between tasks. You're focusing on one task and then you go to the next task after a break. Um, so there are actually a lot of free apps to use that will help facilitate using the Pomodoro technique. We would love to, you, if you know of any that you've used, we'd love for you to share them in the chat box. You, If you look up on your app store, you know, Pomodoro Focus Timer, or there are also other to-do apps to help you help use this technique. It's What's great about this technique is that it really utilizes both modes of thinking, both that diffused mode and the focus mode. And But know that if you or your student are in a really good flow when the 25-minute timer goes off, it's okay to continue working. Just remember to eventually take that reward when the flow finally stalls out because your brain absolutely needs that diffuse time. Utilize the timer to mitigate those breaks to prevent procrastination. Setting that timer for the break is just as important as setting it for focus time to make sure it's a short break and then you're going back to focusing. And even consider having loud or funny timers or whatever to make a noise that reminds your student when it's time to return to work. So we do have another video for you on focused versus diffuse thinking. This is just going to review those concepts of diffused and focused modes of learning and the ping pong technique. The basic idea is that we have two ways of learning new information. We have focused and diffused thinking. Ping pong explains how to switch between focused and diffused thinking in order to increase your understanding and get creative. Wearing tiny shorts and grunting is optional. Focused learning works by looking at a problem set and trying real hard to get it. It's about actively using every ounce of mental force to understand the problem that is in front of us. It's like seeing a brick wall and reasoning, it's too hard to just run through and too tall to climb. Diffused learning is just letting your mind wander without a plan. It can deepen your understanding or trigger new creative thoughts. With diffused learning, your mind might say, hey, why don't we tie a bunch of balloons together and just float over it? Both processes are important to maximize your understanding of a problem you're facing. To truly optimize your learning, play ping pong between the two. Focus, relax, focus, relax, focus, relax. The best practice is to first focus all your attention, ideally shutting off any distractions like your phone and other noise. After doing this for a while, 
A timer can be used. Deliberately stop to focus and let your mind freely wander. This is when the brain connects what you just focused on with other information stored in your memory, which leads to deeper thinking, better retention, and allows for creative thoughts to happen. Painter Salvador Dali was using the ping pong technique. After a round of focused work, Dali sat on his armchair to think and doze off. In one hand, he held a big key, and the moment he fell asleep, the key dropped. The sound of the key woke him, and he would go back to the canvas to continue his focused work. Steve Jobs broke up his daily thinking routine by going out for long walks. The ping pong technique can be useful to study for tests. Start with the most difficult problem. Once you get stuck, switch to a more simple one. While doing the easier problem, your brain will keep the difficult problem in its working memory. Without conscious thought, your brain will look for connections and try to make sense of the initial, more difficult problem. Once you are done with the easy problem, go back to the difficult one. Maybe it wasn't as difficult as you thought. Please use the comment section below to let us know if you find this technique useful and subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive. So again, learning to maximize both types of thinking, the focused and the diffused, strengthens those neural connections and it can help your children improve their learning. So let's talk about memory. Do you remember Kevin in that first video, how he seemed completely lost? Everything he thought he knew about math just fell out of his head and he didn't remember anything. So the brain has two types of memory. We have working memory and then we have long-term memory. Working memory is what you're thinking about in the moment, what's happening to you right now, what just happened three minutes ago and why you're doing what you're doing whereas long-term memory is the storage of everything that you've learned previously. And how we use our working memory in the moment will influence how those memories are stored in our long-term memory. Both types of memory are essential in the brain's learning process. Michelle? Okay, thank you. We have something fun for you all. I hope you're all awake and paying attention. We have a, a, some objects on the screen. We're going to give you 10 seconds to try to remember what is on there. It's a very loud noise. Okay, we're going to switch, <laughs> switch it on. So, uh, how many objects do you remember? I'll give you just a moment. If you want to, you can write the number in the chat box, but you don't need to, you can keep it personal. Um, but in this game, we were using a working memory. So part of that, a brain that uses and temporarily holds on to the information, um, like learning new material, maybe schoolwork. Wow, wow, Heather, that I'm impressed. <laughs> um, learning new, looking at objects and remembering them, or maybe something simple like a phone number. Um, that working memory has limited capacity. Um, it can hold usually up to four thoughts or concepts, so 12, awesome. Um, everybody's a little different. Some people have more capacity, but it is still limited and, and it can't really be changed for each person. So trying to manage more information in working memory can really just cause a lot of frustration. So let's, so what are some tips that we can do to strengthen that working memory? Note taking, that's why we take notes in class, right? Some people find that it's better to use maybe different colors for different subjects, for topics, or, or maybe not a really fast note taker. Some kids are better to listen and it's just hard to do both. Um, find someone in your class and review the notes with them. That's always good to compare to see if you miss anything. Um, it's good to look over and review those notes right after class or at the end of that day because you're bringing those ideas fresh back in your mind again. You can always add pictures or convert the notes into pictures to help your brain also remember a little bit easier. And when possible, again, review these things right before you go to bed. Um, our younger kids can review their homework, you know, um, maybe not notes, they're not taking notes, but they're doing homework, looking at numbers or 
colors or something like that. Uh, for more difficult concepts or a little bit older elementary school, middle school kids, you can break the material into manageable steps. So you want to plan days ahead and the amount of work to work on each step. So do it over time. Make sure you incorporate those resting periods and work on each step until you master it. So for example, learning long division. So we want to review that step by step and then practice it. And then we want to use tools. Videos are a great tool. So as students see and hear, they can pause, rewind, and review the information as many times um, as they want to. I know my son was during COVID really learned to like the online courses he had to take for that reason alone, <laughs> because he could go back and watch the class over and over again. So you can free your working memory a little bit by using stuff, things like to-do lists, organizers, and maybe your smartphone. I know that I wake up a lot of times during the night and I have something on my mind that I don't want to forget. So I'll write it down. I have a notepad by the bed and then I can go back to sleep because I know that I will remember it in the morning. Um, does anybody have any apps that they use for things like reminders? to help them with that working memory. I definitely use my phone and my alerts on my phone. Another thing you can do to strengthen that working memory is to use routines. So that when you're doing routine things, it helps free up that working memory. So when the tasks become automated, the task is no longer requiring that working memory function. So remembering what to do next takes up that cognitive workspace. So with routines, you don't have to think about it. It just happens routinely. So let's talk about building that long-term memory now. The long-term memory is where the brain stores information for extended periods of time, where those stronger neural connections are built. And it's a goal for our children is to move what they've learned in their working memory to that long-term memory so that they can learn. So let's look at a memorization uh, a technique, active recall. So memorization, of course, is very important. It allows for a faster and a higher level of thinking. If a student gets asked to compare the French and American Revolution, a higher conceptual level question, the student will need facts such as dates and geographic content to comprehend and answer that question. So memory and comprehension are interrelated. So some of the tools that can aid in memorization are probably things that you and I have used as you know students ourselves, flashcards. They can be index cards is how I used to do it, but I know there are virtual apps out there, Quizlet, other things that you can do to create flashcards, but they help, you know, you look at that information, you can shuffle them, alternate them. And then as you find that you are not struggling with some, you can set those aside and only work on the ones that you're having difficulty with. And this repetition assists with learning. And again, you don't wanna do this all in one night. You wanna space this out over several days. Conversation. If students can talk to you about what they learn during the day, any topic, and it helps them remember what they've learned. They can uh, teach and explain using their own words to you, maybe a younger sibling or a classmate, but all that is reviewing everything that they've learned. But again, that information has to be reviewed daily. You wanna recall that material over time until they can recall it without notes or prompts or looking at that flashcard. So let me ask you a question. If how well do you think a student would do on a math test? They had to learn, let's, let's say in, um, spelling. They had to learn 25 words the night before a spelling test. How well do you think they'll do the next day? They only are studying the night before the test. So the truth is, and you can put your answer in the chat box or you can think about it, but the truth is that students may actually be able to memorize most of those words 
It's kind of a form of passive learning. However, to move those words into long-term memory, it's best to study for, you know, two to four, five words a day, and then recall the ones they've learned from the previous day. So kind of adding on to those, the ones you know, and adding the new ones. Of course, every child is different. Some need more practice and repetition than others. And some students might actually get an A on that test, that spelling test the next day, but no student is moving that material into, long, into their long-term memory after one night of cramming. So it's not ideal. It's okay for grades in that instance, but it's not, not, they're not learning it. Another thing is sleep. We know that the brain changes during the learning process and changes also happen during sleep. The brain rehearses that information that we gather during the day and strengthens that foundational memory as we sleep. So we want to have our children get a good night's sleep. Help them to do that by avoiding anything that emits blue light, you know, their phones, their tablets, computer screens. You could actually download a blue light blocking app or maybe change devices to backlight. I actually have a, a blue light cover on my phone post to black blue light. I don't know. Um, but the American Academy of Sleep recommends the following, um, as you can see on the screen, sleep requirements for children of different ages, 12, nine to 12 hours for six to 12 year olds and for our older kids, the eight to 10 hours. So the, the, that's an ideal amount. And Catherine, go learn a new technique. Thanks, Michelle. So another category of memorization techniques are mnemonic devices. And these are particularly helpful for learning large amounts of information. So the mnemonic techniques, and I bet a lot of you are familiar with these already, are, well, first we would talk about acronyms, which these are when you form a word from the first letter of a group of words. And you can, you can create your own of these. A really common one that a lot of us learned in school is homes for the Great Lakes. Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. You can even use this for day-to-day -day situations and tell your kids how to use it for day-to-day -day situations. Maybe you have to take a quick run for, to the grocery store and you don't, or the commissary, and you don't need a whole long list. You just have to pick up a few things. Make an acronym to remember them. Maybe it's you're picking up pasta, apple, cereal, and eggs. So your acronym is PACE. I just remember need to remember to pick up PACE, my those five, those few things. Another technique would be acrostics. This is a sentence or a whole phrase instead of just a word. So things like uh, my very elderly mother just served us noodles to learn the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Sorry, Pluto. Another, if you have a child who's a musician like I do, a lot of them will, when they're learning the notes on the, on the clefs, every good boy deserves fun which represents the lines on the treble clef and how they, what notes they correspond to. Other great mnemonic devices are songs and metaphors. A uh, song helps you remember because the brain is using known and stored information. Michelle and I just talked about this recently. How many of you still can sing at least part of the state song? I know, you know, the Alabama, Alaska, I will spare you and not sing it for you today. I know when I was learning Spanish in school, we used a lot of nursery rhymes that we already knew, but then used them in Spanish to learn the months of the year or fingers or emotion words. And still to this day, I can sing all of those, those little songs. So these are all great ways to, to remember things. And Michelle also mentioned that her daughter's calculus class, so high level math, were tasked with creating songs about calculus to help them remember certain concepts. Students can also remember things by building similarities between something they already know and what they're trying to recall. So for example, maybe they're learning the different types of clouds and they are trying to remember which one is the cumulus cloud, but they know the word accumulate because you've mentioned how their dirty clothes keep accumulating on the floor. And so that cloud is puffy like a pile of laundry. So it's a cumulus cloud because it's all accumulated. 
Some other memorization techniques include mental imaging, and this is where you're forming mental images in your mind associated with things you want to remember, because our brains are hardwired for visual information. About 50% of our neocortex is devoted to processing visual information. So when remembering a fact or a word, create a mental image of that fact or that word. So for example, if you're trying to remember how to spell the word skiing, particularly the fact that it's got two eyes there in the middle next to right next to each other, make a mental image of a pair of, of parallel skis to remind you that there are two eyes in the middle of skiing. And also, sometimes you'll notice that it's remember, easier to remember someone's name when you can see it on a name tag. So you're both hearing it when they say it, but then you're also looking at it and seeing how it's spelled, and then you may have an easier time remembering their name. Memory champions also use mental images using a technique called Memory Palace. And we're going to watch a short video about the Memory Palace. How to improve your memory with the Memory Palace technique. Memory can fade with age. Stay sharp by using the Memory Palace technique to recall information. You will need a familiar place and a vivid visual imagination. Step 1. Select a place with many rooms that you can vividly picture in your mind's eye, such as your home or workplace. Step 2. Chart a specific route through every nook and cranny of your palace. Always start in the same place, follow the same path, and end in the same place. Step 3. Create a system for traveling through each room, such as always going from left to right. Note all of the features of each room, such as a desk, lamp, trash bin, dresser, and a painting. See each item as a memory slot where you can store information. Step 4. Associate objects or ideas you want to remember with features in your memory palace. Locate them on your route in the order that you want to remember them. Exaggerate images to aid in the recall process. For instance, imagine tons of huge apples dangling from one of your houseplants to remind yourself to buy apples. Step 5. Start at the beginning of your route and visit each feature in turn to readily recall the information you have stored. Soon, people will comment on your excellent memory. Did you know, memory recall dramatically drops within the first 20 minutes of learning something. All right, so you remember the, the memory activity that Michelle did with you a couple, a few minutes ago, and here are all of our objects here on the screen. It might take a little bit more than 10 minutes, but now imagine using that memory palace technique to memorize these things really quick. And hopefully you've already have your memory palace, after you've practiced this technique, you've, you already have your memory palace in your mind. I personally have to use my childhood home because I have so many different homes as an adult because of the military. So I find my childhood home works better for my memory palace. And then I walk if, in the 10 seconds I have, the 15 seconds if I have, I will think about where I would put all these things. I'll hang those candy canes on where our Christmas tree went and shove that pretty shoe in my childhood closet because I would have loved it. I maybe put the cat outside because my parents wouldn't have never let us have a cat when I was a child. And the balloon animal I would put on the ceiling of my room, like it was floating, like it was a helium balloon animal. So you can see how if you already have your memory palace established, in those 10 seconds, you can put those things away really quickly and then just think, recall, walk through your memory palace and pull those different things where you placed them in your memory. The goal is to help your brain move information from our working memory into our long-term memory. And we invite you to practice this technique, to master it, and then to talk to your children about it when they're trying to memorize things. So let's talk about improving learning through reading. When we read, of course, we're learning. We're taking in information. And children typically are in the process of learning to read from kindergarten, sometimes earlier, to about third grade. Typically, in third grade, most children have started to make that transition to reading to learn. And because at that point, the actual 
knowing how to read has become part of their long-term memory. So they can just do it. And then that's, they can start learning the things that they're actually reading. So a few tips for effectively learning through reading. The first is to use active recall, like Michelle was talking about before. So one of the things you can do if you have if your student is reading something for the sake of learning that content, first have them take what we would call a picture walk through that book or that material. That means review each of the chapters for pictures, for titles, captions, headings, anything in bold or in italicies, or in, particularly in school materials, there may be questions at the end. Look at all of that ahead of time and then chat about it a little bit. Ask your child, what do you think this book is going to be about? And have them organize their thoughts about what they're about to read. Then actually start the reading. If your child reads anything that doesn't make sense, read it again and maybe make a few notes. Not too many. You don't want to overwhelm them or have them get overwhelmed, but make a couple of notes as they're reading. And then after you've after your child has read a page or two, have them look away from the page and try to recall as much of the information as possible. Have them play that information back to you, particularly stating it out loud if they're willing to kind of chat it back with you about what it is that they just read. This is a great way to help them really activate that active recall on what they've just read. A couple of tips, make sure they're not that their method isn't just reading the same page over and over and over again and taking in all the material all at once over and over again. I think we all know how easy it can be to start at the top of the page and get to the bottom of the page without really internalizing a single thing that you just read. Instead, we want to use these engaging techniques, things that are making our are helping our child to think about what they're reading and really sort of store it. Also, and this is especially one to, to give to our teenagers who have started studying and are maybe highlighting while they study, be mindful not to over-highlight large amounts of texts. Um, instead, just pull those main ideas. And this is a key to active recall. If this all seems a little bit overwhelming, consider having your child use the technique when reading for fun at first. Maybe your child is reading a book about baseball. Have them pause and, and recite back to you. What, what are you learning? What's in, what does this say about baseball or this baseball player or whatever it is that, that they're reading? Because when a child can recall those materials without minim, with minimal prompts, that's when you know they've learned it and they've got it. So we actually have another webinar that we'd love for you to check out on the Homework Power Hour, and I will put a link to that in your chat box as well. Michelle? Thank you. So we talked about all these techniques and how we learn. Let's look at some obstacles for learning. So have you ever heard your child say, I just don't have enough time to do this right now? Or the opposite, maybe they're like, it's just going to take a minute, so I'll be okay. Or I can only learn a certain way. Or what I'm learning is useless. I will never need this information. I'm sure we've all heard all of those things. But those are some of the common obstacles to learning. Uh, however, children and our families can overcome them and improve their ability to learn by using some of the techniques that we talked about today. The Pomodoro technique, you know, helping with time and preventing that procrastination. Using the different methods to reach all the senses, like Catherine said, videos, songs, hands-on activities. Encouraging our kids to learn new things. So not only do what they're passionate about, but you know, do, venturing out and doing new things, trying new things, builds that mental flexibility. Changes their kind of old ways of thinking. And they can explore ways that we as parents can explore ways of helping our children feel more comfortable in their learning environment. So we wanna make sure they have a good study area, make sure the room is well lit. Again, talk about avoiding those distractions and all of those can help improve learning and they're able to, because they're able to increase the concentration and retention levels when they have that great atmosphere. And we want to work on our ch children and our family's mindset. So mindset is a mental attitude. And it determines really how we inter interpret and respond to situations. So there's such a thing as a growth mindset. And this is where you believe the basic abilities and attributes that a person has can be developed. 
you know, through learning, through dedication, effort, and hard work. It, this person has a love of learning because they understand I can do it. I just need to put the time in and it fosters resilience. This is essential for those big accomplishments that our children are going to be up against. The process of learning they understand is time spent and effort. And higher achievement is the outcome of this learning process if they apply the right effort and ample amount of time. Effort plus time. And they also understand, which is also very key, is that mistakes are a necessary part of learning and growth. Changes are a part of growing. So let's take a look at the other side, the fixed mindset. And we have we all have a little bit of both of these, but one tends to be a little stronger. The fixed mindset person believes that intelligent or talents are fixed. They cannot be significantly developed. You either have them or you don't. That the abilities that you have are based on just who you are. You know, I was born with the ability to, or not with the ability to run or wh whatever, and it can't be changed. So we want to help our children shift to that growth mindset when we hear them talking in a fixed mindset way. One of the ways we can do that is by teaching them the simple, three little word, yet. Yet allows children to view those mistakes because that fixed mindset doesn't like the mistakes. They don't understand that it's part of learning, but they allow them to view those mistakes as a healthy part of the learning process, allowing for that continued growth instead of like, I can't do it and giving up. So it allows the openness to find a solution. So let's take a look at some examples. So they may come to you and say, I will never make the soccer team, you know, and you feel bad. But if they turn their thoughts around, they could say, I haven't made the soccer team yet. And they know that they can work on their skills and hopefully make the soccer team the next time. Or I'm just horrible at math. Or you could turn around and say, I don't understand this math concept yet with the understanding of, okay, we need to change whatever we're doing to learn that math concept. So today was a great opportunity for you to put um, your practice, to practice what we learned today. So you could move today's information, everything we taught you in from your working memory to your long-term memory. And of course, how do we do that? We encourage you to review what you learned today. Um, we hope you maybe took some notes, but the resource, it will be in the chat box. And a lot of what we talked about is in that resource. Um, so you can recall what you uh, read in the webinar on that resource. You could share it with somebody and you can review it again tomorrow. So helping our children understand how their brain learns will help them learn better. So we encourage you to practice some of the techniques yourself that we presented today and to share them with your family to maximize their brain's learning power. Today's technological world allows us to access a greater variety of learning tools, such as this webinar. So we, uh, we want you to help your child access and find the appropriate tools that work for them. Andrea? Thanks, Michelle. So we just want to thank you again for joining us for this webinar today. We would love to invite you to take our survey for the webinar, as I mentioned early before we started. You can do that by clicking on that survey link that I just put there in your chat box, or you can use that QR code on your screen. It you, this will just take a few minutes to get your feedback. Once you're in the survey, you will click on webinar survey. You'll type in that four digit webinar number, which is easy this time. It is 2424. Be sure to hit submit at the end of the survey. And if you're not able to fill out the survey now, that's totally okay. Following this webinar, you will receive an email invitation to take it. Like I mentioned before, this is a tool that we use to make ongoing improvements to our webinar series, add new topics of interest, and also to provide feedback to our funders. We would love it if you just take that two or three minutes necessary to complete the survey. If you've missed one of our previous webinars, or especially if you'd like to share this webinar with someone, recordings can be found on our website, militarychild.org. Um, also, we have a Facebook channel where you, uh, face, excuse me, a YouTube channel where you can also find our archive 
archived videos there as well. And we've put links to those in your chat box. We also invite you to check out SchoolQuest. It is an online interactive tool specially designed to support highly mobile military students and families. It has an entire library of resources and tips to help students achieve academic success and well-being. We encourage you to sign up today. It is free to sign up. It is free to use. Again, you can use that QR code there on your screen, and I will also put a link to that in your chat box here shortly. If you ever find yourself with any questions, concerns, or education-related issues for your military-connected child, our military student consultants are the premier resource for answering those questions. They are, to contact one, you just send an email. If they don't have the answer right away, they will research it for you and help to connect you, connect you to local resources in your area. We absolutely, it's a great resource, especially for those trickier questions or there's very specific questions that maybe the folks you have locally can't answer for you. I'm putting a link to that email address there in your chat box so you can contact them anytime. The I'll be also want to introduce you to the military well-being, military child well-being toolkit. This was developed for parents, school professionals, behavioral and mental health professionals, community leaders. It is a tool full of resources for all aspects of your military connected child's well-being. And we would love for you to take a look at it. I'm going to put a link to that in your chat box as well. We also want to let you know about our 360 summits. Our MSEC 360 summits provide opportunities for cross-sector collaboration, idea sharing, and programming support. For more information, you can use that QR code on your screen, or I will put a link there in your chat box. In fact, we will be in El Paso in a couple of weeks for a 360 summit down there. We'd love to see you there. We also want to let you know about our MSEC Call for the Arts program. Call for the Arts invites military-connected children from all all over the world representing every branch of service to share interpretations through art of what it means to be a military connected child. For more information, you can use that QR code there on your screen. Or again, shortly, I will put a link in your chat box that you can use as well. We would love for you to save the date for our global training summit, which is here in Washington, close to me, which is here near in Washington, D.C., and that will be happening from July 29th through 31st. If you are interested in getting a certificate of completion, please complete that online survey that we got the QR code for today or that you'll get in your inbox. If you'd like to receive a webinar survey for a recorded webinar, please contact um, research at militarychild.org. We also have a couple of upcoming webinars. We've got Helping Your Unorganized Child Get Organized tomorrow at noon. And next week, we on Tuesday, we will have time management for younger children young children, and I'm going to put links to both of those there in your chat box. We just want to say thank you again to Navy Child and Youth Programs for making today's webinar possible. And again, we want to thank all of you for attending today. We really appreciate you. Thanks for being here.